Visa 2019, has it been a good year for Visa? Yeah, so I think Visa, we, we have been uh, growing uh, very steadily uh, over the past couple of years. Uh, in fact, uh, Thanks to a lot of these digital payment, these wallet players and uh, fintech companies, uh, we're able to actually collaborate with them and grow the market, uh, not only on the traditional uh, distribution center, which is today mainly on the banks, right? And uh, we go out and acquiring merchants also through the acquirer, acquiring the merchants and all that. But we work with a few fintech companies to go out there to really acquire uh, the SMEs, the micro merchants, and also those customers that unable to access to credit cards or debit cards, you know, we issue them with a prepaid and digital wallet as well. So we're still growing at double digits and, uh, you know, uh, because we are all measured on the spans uh, and, and also the issuance of a card also is growing on double digits. And in fact, one of our uh, strongest uh, brand, which is uh, contactless, which is Paywave, and you can see the ad at the back there, uh, we got multiple awards on uh, winning, you know, the, the promotion of the contactless in this market. And Malaysia is, is one of the, the market that is growing the fastest uh, in Asia Pacific in terms of contactless adoptions. Uh, so we are seeing that, you know, I just mentioned, uh, we are seeing that the adoption has moved up to 40 over percent and we believe that it will continue to grow at a double digit uh, moving forward. Surely this um, exponential growth will slowly taper down uh, moving forward. Um, uh, do you think that that tapering down will, so, well, will happen soon or you will still continue to grow at so, that particular speed? Yeah, so it's a very good question, Brahim. I think uh, we still have got a very good momentum uh, in terms of uh, the spend on, on the digital payment and the utilizations, uh, whether it's on card or whether it's on online, whether it's through card on file. So we believe that towards the 2020, we're still going to have a very good momentum of growing the adoption of the digital payments. So even though you will use a card somewhere today that is you know already widely accepted let's say you go to a supermarket or you go to uh, everyday spend uh, category departmental store where it's widely accepted on the cards right even tomorrow that segment's really not growing as much as possible but we are opening up new segments out there in the market right so the digital adoption is increasing so the spend on the on the individual customers through a segment is actually opening up so many people will start using on a segment that today traditionally has not been opening up yet. You know, one of the segment is of the car park, vending machines, and all that. So moving forward, we're opening up transit, uh, toll, and all that. Also, is also going to come uh, on board very soon. Still on the consumer business, um, it takes a lot for you to mobilize your sales and um, I guess activation team on the ground. How aggressive do you think they are in um, getting uh, merchants on board, in getting, yeah. <coughs> or, you know, signing up all these car parks yeah. on board, and so yeah. on? Yeah. Yeah. So. One of our key uh, success uh, in terms of our adoption of card payment is actually the adoptions and opening up of new uh, acceptance uh, globally. Yeah. Uh, in fact, if you, if you ask me today, the opening up of acceptance in Malaysia has accelerated so much in the past five years and mainly also due to our work together with uh, Ben Nagara where we actually created a market development funds uh, in uh, to for the industry to actually subsidize them in rolling out you know merchant acceptance device in the market so merchant acceptance device can be on a form of a physical terminal it can be a form of a terminal it can be a form of uh, even through a mobile phone so recently we also launched a tap to phone uh, with Maybank uh, and that tap to phone has actually you know a lot of interest that has been generated through the SME segments that today the volume is actually very small. Yeah. Right? So it doesn't make sense for you to actually buy a you know, few thousand ringgit a terminal and then you put it into a merchant that today the volume is very low. However, with this tap to phone, you can actually just download an app to the phone and then you can uh, just subscribe to opening up a merchant account through the bank. And then you can also define how much you want the account to be able to access through. Let's say you want the limit to be only 10,000 a month. Right? Then uh, you can only accept payments up to 10,000 a month. Yeah. And the rate that they charge is actually reasonable and based on you know, uh, a, a, a flat rate that they actually charge. So this, we believe, is going to open up a lot of other segments uh, moving forward uh, for SME segments. Okay, Still on the growth trajectory, the, surely you are targeting some form of early saturation levels coming soon. Before that comes, what is the rough uh, ballpark figure of market penetration that you intend to take uh, with uh, the advent of fintech and mobile payments and stuff like that? Yeah, 
So if I like, I don't know how propriety yeah. this, this information is going to be. Yeah. So so like like I said, right? Uh, we we believe that the adoption of digital payment is going to continue to grow, mm. right? And we are collaborating with a lot of these fintechs to continue to grow the adoption of digital payment. I don't think uh, the adoption is going to slow. Uh, it will go to still going to uh, accelerate. And in fact, we are seeing, uh, you know, uh, the partnership that we have. Uh, you know, we've done with uh, Razorpay and we've done with uh, you know, uh, Revolut and all that. That is going to even accelerate the growth on the digital payment. Mm. So, in the overall economy, GDP, I, I don't think I want to com comment on that, yeah. but more on the digital payment, I don't think that it's going to be any slowdown uh, moving to 2020 or even 2021. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the adoption rate of Malaysians with digital payments. Um, when I had my conversation with Ben Gara, their greatest concern right now is that it's pretty located in cities um, and not just any cities, it's just the three main big cities yeah. of JB Pin and KL um, and maybe some adoption KK <coughs> and some of the smaller cities like Ita. Yeah. We're still not seeing widespread adoption in tertiary cities, in suburban areas, sub-rural areas. Yeah. What is stopping, um, I guess, digital payments from adoption from these particular areas? Yeah. So, <coughs> so you are, you are right, most of the adoption is mainly focus on the city centres and, and all that. And that's why we, together with, with Ben Agara, together with a traditional bank that we are working with, uh, we come up with a product like a tap to phone to ensure that people that is not in the city centre, I mean, most of the people have mobile phones, not only one, probably two mobile phones, which is either Android based or iPhone, right? So with, with this product that we actually introduce, we can actually adopt and spread it across not only on the city centres because they can actually download it through the, through the app anywhere they want, right? And they don't even have to go to the branch to meet the bank officer in order for them to activate the, the tap to phone services. It can be anywhere. So we believe that the adoption is going to spread out outside of the city centre uh, with this new product that's uh, coming into the market. And moving forward, we're going to introduce a lot more of this digital product as well to actually serve the underserved and uh, probably some of this, uh, you know, in the outskirt area, as you actually mentioned. Let's talk about your traditional partners, the banks. You've been working with banks with over, you know, over four or five decades, um, and now you're trying to partner with fintechs, um, startups. Um, is this a clear shift moving away from the traditional customers, or this is just creating another avenue of a revenue channel for you guys? No, is it? I think we believe that you know the the, the pie is big enough, right? Today, there's still about sixty percent of the usage is still on cash and checks. Mm. Uh, yeah, so there's only about thirty to thirty-five percent is on the card payments or any other forms of payment. So, uh, in the past three years, with the introduction of wallets, you know, it, it has actually increased the penetration on digital payment, on the usage. Uh, but however, I, I think the, 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 the pace is not fast enough, right? So I think that's why we are, we are here to try to enable that. We want to enable the usage on digital payment, whether it's on cards, whether it's on wallet. Uh, I think it is, we are collaborating and working together uh, to ensure you know, the country adoption on digital payment actually increase to a level that is acceptable. So that's our objective. One area that I haven't touched on is on tokenization. Yeah. Um, is Visa looking into this area? Yeah, definitely, Ibrahim. I think tokenization is one of the key area that we are going to uh, accelerate the, the growth of um, the e-commerce transactions because today, a lot of the transactions, payments are done behind the scene. Even it's very seamless to the to the consumer. Yeah. So and then uh, security is the utmost importance to us, and that. Uh, recently, we also launched our security roadmap to uh, to most of the banks that is uh, is is our our customers, and two key areas that we actually emphasize in there is one is the the tokenization because once you tokenize the transactions, uh, the card uh, you know information you won't be able to see right is is actually a one time usage on the card number, so. We don't have to worry about PCI DSS, uh, yeah. you know, and anymore. And the cost of doing it is actually much cheaper. Uh, oh, is that yeah, so? it's much cheaper. So we, we actually work with uh, the banks. We work with Payment Gateway as a token requester, and okay. that to roll out uh, all this. Uh, as long as the Payment Gateway has enabled to appear request for the token, then you can actually roll out seamlessly. All right. So the other one that we're also working on is the 3D 2.0. Uh, so 3D 2.0, uh, you know, today when you do any e-commerce transaction you actually receive an OTP right and, and 
uh, is actually a 3D authentication transaction to ensure that end-to-end e-commerce transaction is very safe. Yeah. Uh, so with 2.0, we are also moving towards not only OTP, we are using an AI to actually authenticate you, the pattern of you spend and also the behavior of you so that we are actually able to authenticate you with very, very good customer experience. But I would have to allow that on my device. Yes, you have to allow that on Why your Why would I do that? I mean, it's crazy, right? For you guys to go through my phone and understand no, how I behave. No, uh, we, don't, we don't actually go through your phone to know that how you behave, but we work through the experience that you purchase from let's say you know we work with Shopee or yeah. Lazada yeah. and all that right so yeah. it's those experience in uh, even Google that we work with them that, yeah. that's the experience that we work with them not through your phone mm -hmm. but your phone will have to be allowed to access to allow that 3.20 uh, 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 device has a secure device to be able to do, do you that. think consumers have all the information needed to allow to to give that consent yeah definitely Right. So the, the, the thing is that you know we are rolling out on uh, on stages and also only for customers that really uh, wants to have the experience yeah. uh, and good experience through it. But um, but today uh, you know the the, the, the regulations uh, you know still um, uh, very much into every transaction has to be on on OTP. Yeah, but single t single yeah, uh, single authentication. Yeah, but that's where we are working towards uh, very closely with the regulators to see. Uh, how we can actually enable that and provide a better customer experience. Okay, I've got two operational questions for you because of the statements you gave earlier. The first uh, operational question is, uh, why is it cheaper um, for uh, tokenization as opposed to traditional um, transactions? Uh, is, is, uh, what has happened to a point where it's cheaper for you guys? So today, uh, if you look at the whole entire uh, transactions, right? If you use uh, tokens, in fact, there's no fee. We don't charge anything at all on tokenization today. Why? because it is a security that we actually provide to our consumer as a peace of mind. Okay. So if you, if, if, you see security is it's extremely important for us because if there's no trust into that payment, there's nobody no is going to use. Gonna yeah, close. it's not going to happen, yeah. right? So we will want to continue to ensure that we improve our security, yeah. uh, you know, f between the two endpoints. Yeah. And so that, you know, consumer will be very, very, um, you know, they, they have the confidence and trust to actually go and perform the transaction because we don't want to wait for the hackers to come in and you know, start uh, hacking all our existing security before we improve it. We will continuously improve our security, our layer uh, to make sure that we are ahead of the, the hackers right. in the market. The second operation question is on um, adoption of uh, digital payments on the rise. You were mentioning this earlier in the interview, particularly amongst Malaysians. Do you know why? I mean, I, I don't know whether this is a business question, this is more of a psychological question, but do you know why digital payments are well adopted in Malaysia, perhaps one of the highest in Asia Pacific? What makes Malaysians love digital payments? Well, I think uh, it, it's a combination of, uh, of um, many factors, right? Because uh, it is, if, if you look at the, uh, the uh, based on our research, uh, 70 over percent of the um, uh, transactions today is uh, when you do it on e-commerce, it's on through mobile devices. Okay. And you know that our penetration of mobile devices is more than 100%, right? Everyone has got either minimum one phone or two phones yeah. in there. It's actually 120%. 120%, uh, yeah. yeah. So, so if, if, if you ask me, uh, definitely it's because of the whole entire ecosystem that has been provided, you know, providing the convenience, access points and all that to have allowed these people to have that kind of uh, mentality of doing uh, digital payment. Mm. And also, uh, I think the, 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 the government and the regulators are really promoting digital payments in a very, very big way. Mm. Uh, and they are also creating a lot of awareness together with uh, our traditional banks and together with, uh, you know, a, a global company like us to go out there to really promote uh, digital payment in a very, very big way. Finally, um, I want to touch a little bit on e-wallets. Um, there's plenty of e-wallets out there. Yeah. I don't know whether you can mention it, I can mention it. There's GrabPay, Fave, Touch and Go Digital, you name it. Apparently, there's 44 digital yeah. payments as per published by Bank Negara yeah. report. 44, yeah. right? I mean, I don't know whether Visa Pay or Visa Wallet is going to be in the mix as well. Is this a real threat for your business? Yeah. This is a very good question, eh, Brian, and everyone that I meet will always ask me these questions. You know, I even ask Master Gun. <laughs> so, so, you see, going back to the, the, you know, when I raised this adoption on the digital payment in this country, right, so it's still about 60% of the, 
of the transaction is being done through cash and checks in Malaysia, right? So to me, the pie is big. Meaning, you know, do we see them as a competitor? No, I don't. I, in fact, I see them as a partner, and we, I see them as a partner that I can collaborate with them, and we're operating on a network of networks. They are operating in the ecosystem themselves, and that, you know, they are focusing a lot of the micro merchants, you know, and small ticket size transactions and all that. We want to enable that uh, to access to our network so that they can also access to our global acceptance uh, moving forward. And I, I think there's a lot of collaborations that we're working on, and that's why today uh, we're doing a digital day here in, in, in Orbit, and then we're inviting all the fintech companies here to, for us to actually showcase and allow them to participate in our fast tech fintech program moving forward. Okay, yep. nice, nice cue in into this. I want to yeah. talk about the Orbit Hub, why we're here. What is this place? So, so this is you got to uh, you got to. I'm, I'm just gonna have a chat with him for quite a bit. You just got to chill down. Yeah. Yeah. Orbit Hub. So Orbit, uh, is it today? Um, we have got globally five innovation center, right? We have five innovation center uh, globally. We have what in, we have San Francisco. We have in New York, in Dubai, in Singapore, and in Beijing. Mm. Uh, and most of the people that we actually talk to, they would like to go to Singapore Innovation Center to look at our discovery, you know, discover discovery session to attend our discovery session to do more co-creations, uh, how we can collaborate with fintechs and all that. But we won't be able to go there every day in Singapore because it's packed and everyone wants to be, be there and want to go through the whole entire co-creation. That's why we are bringing it over to Malaysia. And it's very fortunate that you know, we have Hizam and MDAC to be able to allow us to host our centre here. And in fact, we are bringing quite a number of the banks as well as the fintech companies to come here to really do a lot of co-creation so new products can actually come out and we do it within two days a prototype can can actually uh, come out and so that they don't actually have to waste so much time developing the actual product and come out that hey, it doesn't work yeah so so what we have here is that we really have got a, a, a co-creation center and we can bring the Singapore uh, people the subject matter expert to come here to facilitate the whole entire session so today with these 120 participants, uh, I believe you know some of them uh, really would want to know how do they actually participate in our fintech fast track. What are the criteria? How do they come on board? How much time is required? How much resources? What is the cost that is required to come on board into Visa? And that's where we add value. We enable them, right? So there's also that 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 reality of startups, fintech startups making it big. Because on the wall plastered behind you, the fintech partners, they're actually multi-million, if not billion dollar companies. I'm talking about Razor, Absolutely. Merchant Trade, Absolutely. Soft Space. I mean, these are, these are companies that already have capital. Yeah. They might need know-how and therefore they partner with you. But what about the startup out there with, you know, there's 5,000 ringgit in their working capital. How can they pull it off yeah. against these kind of big guys? Yeah. So is it Fintech, they are all started off small as well, right? They are not big like yesterday. You know, we have been working with them for years, right? Like, uh, you know, Virgin Trade, uh, their focus previously wasn't on payments, they are more on the money exchange business. Yeah, of course. Uh, so, space is very much focusing on m they wasn't even coming to Fintech yeah. wallet players. And Razor, everybody knows Razor. Razor, so. yeah, Razor is not gaming. Payment yeah, up, absolutely. Way. So that's, that's where we actually add value, right? I mean, we are the largest payment company globally and that the payment, we, we, every day we, we eat and we, we, we breath payments, right? We are the expert in those areas. So that's why we, we enable and we allow the payment component because every transaction is go through. Any product and services you offer out there require payments, right? And that's where we enable that piece to make sure that they don't actually have to worry about how do I get the customers uh, to make the payment. So even if you are small today, right, any product and services you offer out there, I can just offer an API for you to call to our payment component and access to our system. So globally, we have got you know, uh, a couple of thousand developers that develop APIs uh, as part of our Visa developer platform. They can access to that mm. at no cost. Mm. Right? You can call up the API for geolocation, for security, for fraud, access and all that. It's, it's all at, at no cost. Um, the fintech partners that come here, um, one of the things that they want to partner with you guys is because of the know-how of uh, payments. Um, and that is the gem that you can share with them. What about access to capital? Are you looking at venture capital arms to actually fund these kind of fintech players so that once they have a viable product, minimum viable product out there, it's time for them to actually you know, yeah. 
get yeah. themselves out in the market. Yeah. Do you think that there is an opportunity for Visa to become a venture capital? Yeah, I mean, Cap capitalist. Yeah, I mean, of course, we 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 always look at opportunities, right? And uh, we have, in recent years, acquired quite a number of. Uh, fintech companies. And that's the thing, you, you yeah. acquiring is, is, a, is, a, is a SOP for you guys. Yeah. Funding it, how about that? So you see, today, depending on your business case and depending on where uh, you know, uh, we see your business is heading it to, providing funding or incentive to actually drive the business is part and parcel of our uh, uh, operating model as well. Mm. Right? So a lot of the uh, smaller companies and all that come on board Visa system uh, it is, uh, we, we cannot expect them to build the system uh, from scratch. It's going to cost millions yeah. of dollars and all yeah. that, right? So we actually come up, bring them to our processor, a third-party processor, and then we, uh, we have a model what we call a bin sponsor so that they don't actually have to apply even a full license. And we subsidize a lot of the fees and charges and so that they can actually come on board. Uh, so when they actually grow and accelerate, then they can apply for a full-fledged license. Right, Kimmy, thank you very okay. much. That's, uh, Thanks, that's bro. Very